The following video includes chapters on the history and policy behind RTI. What RTI is and how it was implemented in the Stoughton School District. What RTI might look like in your school. And a final video tutorial on progress monitoring and curriculum-based measurement. Now let's begin with a brief discussion of the history of RTI. It's important before discussing the legal basis for RTI and the core principles of the model that we have a common language for defining what RTI is. We believe the IDEA partnership definition is one that focuses on decision making based on student achievement. The IQ achievement discrepancy approach was institutionalized in 1975. However, research conducted over the past 30 years has shown this model to be unreliable. Some of the original assumptions for identifying learning disabilities and designing special education instruction have been found to be unsupported by research findings. One of the assumptions was that underlying processing deficits could be reliably identified and then remediated. Another assumption was that cognitive processing strengths could be accurately identified and outcomes improved if instructional methodology were matched to these strengths. However, existing research has repeatedly shown no support for these assumptions. In 2001, the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Special Education Programs, otherwise known as OSEP, sponsored a summit inviting LD experts to discuss the rapid increase in the number of students identified as learning disabled. The experts concluded that the RTI approach was supported in extensive research conducted over the last 40 years, and they endorsed using it to make important educational decisions, including eligibility for special education. The President's Commission was convened to make recommendations concerning how special education services could be improved. Their report recommended an emphasis on early intervention as well as the use of assessment practices that were more closely linked to instruction. The Commission strongly urged changing LD eligibility criteria from a discrepancy model to a response to intervention model, which documents how a student suspected of having a learning disability responds to appropriate instruction. The NASDAQ publication emphasized that the push away from traditional practices and the pull toward better alternatives are essential to the current consensus regarding RTI. If the general and special education programs are not well integrated, the effectiveness of both is diminished. No child left behind requires all students to have access to the general education classroom. Traditional assessment and eligibility determination practices have few implications for designing effective instructional or behavioral interventions. The current wait-to-fail model causes harm by delaying interventions in kindergarten or first grade when academic and behavior problems may begin to emerge to later grades when persistent achievement problems are more difficult to resolve. Early identification and interventions can prevent or mitigate the effects of risk conditions that make disability identification more likely for the economically disadvantaged and minority children. It's critical to note the language in IDEA 2004 is permissive. It eliminates the requirement for a discrepancy calculation. However, it does not prohibit the use of discrepancy. It prevents the state from precluding the use of RTI if a local education agency adopts an RTI eligibility model. Once No Child Left Behind is reauthorized, RTI is expected to be addressed in the laws regulating regular education as well as in IDEA. The RTI pyramid is an all-school framework for both academic and behavioral supports. 
The underlying premise of this model is prevention is far more effective and efficient than remediation. In Tier 1, all students receive a research-based core curriculum in the general education classroom. The assumption is that approximately 80% of students given this instruction will not need further assistance. Tier 2 involves providing an additional research-based intervention above the core minutes, which is often delivered in a small group, typically for six to eight weeks. These targeted Tier 2 students may receive intervention from teachers who are experts in the targeted area, such as a reading teacher or behavioral support staff. Progress monitoring occurs more frequently during this tier. It is anticipated that 15% of students will have their educational difficulties alleviated at this level. Researchers differ with the focus of the third tier. In some districts and states, tier three is considered special education. In other districts and states, tier three is viewed as highly intensive, individualized instruction. Progress monitoring is intensified and may occur daily. While this three-tiered approach is the most prevalent model in the literature, other districts have additional tiers within their RTI framework. These principles are the foundational pieces of the puzzle in implementing RTI. The principles are interlinked and critical to the success of the framework. No Child Left Behind and IDA require the use of a curriculum that is supported by scientifically based research. The term scientifically based research means research that involves the application of rigorous, systematic, and objective procedures to obtain reliable and valid knowledge relevant to educational activities and programs. This is to ensure students are exposed to curriculum that has demonstrated its effectiveness for a large majority of students. The curriculum you choose for implementation needs to have evidence of producing proficient levels of achievement and is based on your state standards. Do a needs assessment and evaluate your existing curriculum. Some key questions to reflect on are, is the curriculum validated by research that supports 80% student success rates? Is it being implemented in each classroom with fidelity? Is there enough instructional time being allocated to support the program? A major premise of RTI is the principle that all students have access to grade level standards and goals. Thus, all students receive instruction in the regular education classroom using the core curriculum. It is critical that staff have the belief they can effectively teach all children. We found as our data improved, our staff came to believe that all children can learn if instruction is aligned with their needs. Co-teaching and differentiation are paramount to the success of this instructional delivery model. In this video, you are observing a trainer of trainers model. This teacher attended a workshop on differentiation. He is now highlighting the key points from the seminar and presenting at a staff development meeting. So a group of us teachers, uh, we had classroom teachers along with support staff, special ed educators, a tag, talented and gifting, gifted learning specialist, went to a conference workshop presented by Rick Wormley a couple of days ago. And I just wanted to report back to, to you guys what we learned. And the topic was differentiated assessment and grading. If you are planning to implement RTI in your school, here are some essential topics that we believe will be necessary for a successful framework. Every building should conduct an assessment of staff development needs and then prioritize foundational skills needed before you begin implementing RTI. Staff development will be a continuous process as you work to refine the core curriculum as well as add additional interventions. RTI framework cannot be successful without the use of continuous progress monitoring. You are constantly monitoring the performance of the student. The more intense the intervention, the more often you monitor the student. You do not want to lose precious time with a mismatch of instruction or not detecting a need for change in the intensity of instruction. 
Think of progress monitoring as a performance indicator of how the child is doing. It is recommended you choose progress monitoring assessments that can be collected frequently and are sensitive to small changes in behavior. Research strongly supports the effectiveness of using a clearly defined method to determine student needs, develop a plan of action, and analyze data. One of the strengths of a problem-solving approach is the fact that you have a collaborative group of people with a wide range of expertise analyzing the problem. Examples of people who may make up a team are parents, teachers, support staff, counselor, principal, school psychologist, and when appropriate, the student. At step one, the team will determine if the student has a significant problem, and if so, define it in an objective and measurable manner. Any relevant sources of information on a student should be fully analyzed by the members of the team. In order to define the problem, the team begins collecting needed data. As you can see, the team's data collection indicates John is significantly discrepant in his oral fluency skills when compared to his peers. After doing a problem analysis and validating it, the next step is to write a problem statement. At this step, the team decides what they are going to do about the academic or behavior concern. The team should choose interventions that are research-based or strategies that have been validated as effective with a high percentage of students. The goal for the student should be based on baseline data and a projection of an appropriate growth rate needed to meet grade level benchmarks. The team needs to determine a timeline for plan implementation along with selecting a measurement strategy to determine how progress will be measured. Teachers and paraprofessionals who are responsible for implementing the plan may need some initial training. It may be helpful to assign members of the team to make observations to document that the plan is being implemented with fidelity. Other members of the team may be assigned the role of data collectors. In the final step, the team analyzes the data to determine if the student achieved the anticipated rate of growth. Depending on student outcomes, the team determines the next steps for the student. The team may decide to discontinue the intervention if the child has made adequate progress. They could also continue the current strategy, implement a different strategy, move to a more intensive tier intervention, or consider a referral to special education. You can see the first instructional plan produced no improvement. After the problem-solving team met, they devised a new instructional plan. The progress monitoring data supports that the second plan is a success. We are leaving you with several critical questions that we hope you will discuss with your colleagues who are also interested in learning more how implementing RTI can lead to greater student achievement. While every school's RTI model will look different depending on student needs, scheduling, and building goals, learning about our RTI journey may answer many of your questions. Sandhill School is a 5-6 building that follows an 8-period middle school schedule. Staff and students are organized into five different blocks. Our building had been organized into separate programs. This is a common model used in many school districts. With this model, we were moving the student to the programs. Separate programming causes a host of challenges. Having overlapping and uncoordinated programs was inefficient. Teachers worked with only their students. Staff expertise was not identified or aligned with the programs that were delivered. Criteria for entry and dismissal from various programs were inconsistent. Sandhill staff, despite having the best of intentions, would be guilty of following a repetitive pattern. We would look at the standardized achievement data, 
talk about the data, and even do some superficial fixes to the curriculum. However, our WKCE CRT scores remained one of the lowest in Dane County. Our identification rate for students with disabilities remained higher than the state average. Finally, we made the decision to take a leap and make instructional changes because what we were doing year after year was not working for many of our students. We needed to move past the talking stage and make significant changes. As we started learning more about RTI, we became convinced that adopting this framework would give our school the best chance of improving student achievement. Our next step was to gain the full support of our principal as we became the informal co-facilitators. As co-facilitators, we realized that prior to adopting RTI, as a staff, we needed to change much of our thinking about assessment and instruction. We had to focus on factors that would impact student achievement, such as quality of curriculum, instruction, and learning environment. Our district set a new goal to have an integrated, comprehensive delivery service model. After the shift from a program model to a service model occurred, our delivery looks quite different. We now bring almost all support services to the child. There is a stronger commitment to educate each child in the regular education classroom. IDEA infers that least restrictive environment is the regular education classroom. Probably one of the most powerful attributes of a shift from separate programming to a service model is the increased collegiality among the teachers. Teachers problem solve together and services are more efficient. As you will see in our presentation, it took us five years to fully implement an RTI model. We believe this type of deep cultural change takes time. Our school was successful because we took the time to analyze data each year and build needed changes. We credit Dr. Mary Gavigan for having the vision and skills to guide our district through the implementation phases of a research-based comprehensive literacy program. Growing out of the district's strategic plan and standards-based curriculum process, we formed an EC12 English Language Arts Program Committee. That committee, like all of our curriculum committees, began their work by conducting a background study, grounding itself in research and literacy best practices. We established a vision and guiding principles that became the foundation for our work. We believed all students will learn and that more of our students, in fact, could be achieving to higher levels if we put into place processes and procedures that would, in fact, support our students and our staff in accomplishing that. We recognized the importance of strengthening our expectations in our schools and work to develop a common language. We also believed it was critical that all of our students had equal access to a strong research-based core curriculum with quality instruction in their classrooms. Whether they were high achieving or experiencing difficulties, special education or regular education, all of them needed that strong curriculum in their classroom with their classroom teacher. We recognized right at the beginning also that children learn at different rates and at different paces and that they would need tiers of support or a pyramid of interventions to ensure their success. Most of that support would occur through ongoing regular classroom differentiation, but there would be times that it would be necessary for students to receive additional support above and beyond in addition to never in place of the core classroom instruction that was occurring. It's really those beliefs and the implementation of those beliefs sustained over time here in the district that are bringing about the results we're receiving today. It's also that very work that began now a number of years ago that has in fact paved the way for the readiness of our staff to now be ready to move into planning discussions around response to intervention. After studying the research for months, the committee in Stoughton made the decision to adopt a new literacy program. However, 
purchasing a new program is certainly not necessary before you begin implementing RTI. Districts can do a needs assessment of their existing curriculum to determine if any areas need to be expanded or refined. In year two of our timeline, we implemented the new Tier 1 Comprehensive Literacy Program. This in itself was a huge change for teachers, and they needed time to navigate through the changes and become comfortable with them. The district also provided ongoing sustained staff development in effective literacy instructional practices. The really, really cool thing lately about Bald Eagle is we don't have to go anywhere anymore. I had one go past my house twice now. It is so cool. They are real. And they were being extinct. They were very close to being extinct. So you guys are going to bring to this book a ton of background. And they're still a little dangerous. They are. We have to be, we have to be very careful. And the, the breeding pairs are getting, they're becoming more real. So it's very as you saw in the co-teaching video, multiple activities are going on. Student needs are being addressed through flexible grouping. While it is hard to see in the video, students are using different level texts. Students are also being supported by a paraprofessional. Previously at Sand Hill, there were many students with disabilities who received literacy instruction in pull-out classes. Due to the fact that instructional pacing was so slow, students were not exposed to all grade level standards. As a result, a major shift in the delivery of instruction was necessary to ensure success for more children. Currently, all Sand Hill students are receiving their core instruction in the regular education classroom, which is also called Tier 1 level. Sand Hill had no extra budget and no added staff to implement an RTI framework. We emphasized to staff they were not taking on additional responsibilities, but conducting their responsibilities in a new manner. For some staff, it meant letting go of some long-held responsibilities. For example, I had to let go of supporting my students in the area of math while I provided reading interventions to multiple groups of students. By realigning the role and function of the staff, we streamlined our delivery of services and made them more efficient. Staff came to realize that many hands make light work. At the district level, there needs to be a common vision along with a commitment to the vision. The staff and administrators need to have consensus on the need for change. They also need a common language base on RTI. An example in our district was a misunderstanding of the function and role of progress monitoring. There needs to be the expectation that staff and administrators will be accountable and share responsibility for the success of the implementation process. RTI takes teamwork. Building administrators need to be a strong role model. They should be sensitive to the changes that are occurring. Change is difficult, and the RTI framework will more than likely take teachers out of their comfort zone. Collaboration time is another requirement. When designing the building schedule, the administrator needs to give priority to collaboration time. The success of co-teaching is dependent upon adequate time to plan. The building principal has another important role in conducting fidelity checks. With the RTI framework, gone are the days where the teacher goes into the classroom and works in isolation. The RTI framework requires a group effort. Multiple eyes are looking at the data and staff with an array of expertise around the table making decisions for the best possible instruction for the student. As co-teaching became more prevalent in our building, we found an increase in staff sharing responsibilities for all students. On the national level, the role of paraprofessionals vary widely among different schools and districts who are implementing RTI. For example, some interventions are conducted by paraprofessionals who have received training in a specific scripted program. At Sand Hill, we use paraprofessionals to support student success in the core. 
They also support some intervention classes by providing students with skills practice. In an ideal world, many RTI implementation experts recommend staff assume the following roles. The data mentor collects, organizes, displays, analyzes, and interprets the data. The content specialist coordinates curriculum implementation, conducts fidelity checks, and is a professional development trainer. The facilitator creates transition procedures, helps the team to function effectively, and is a cheerleader for the success for each implementation step. The staff liaison seeks input from staff and is the chief communicator. The principal must be the instructional leader on the team. At Sand Hill, we became the building co-facilitators who assumed many of these tasks with support from our principal, psychologist, and other colleagues. In addition, we provided professional development on administering, scoring, and interpreting progress monitoring assessments we also provided support for implementers, including coaching and feedback opportunities. At Sand Hill, we determined co-teachers would be both certified teachers and thus could truly be partners in the instructional effort. While paraprofessionals have a critical role in supporting student success, our staff decided that paraprofessionals co-teaching in a class is not in an appropriate role expectation for them. Co-teaching does not mean two adults are merely present in a classroom at the same time. Co-teaching means both adults jointly provide instruction and assessments. Co-teaching also does not involve taking turns lecturing to the whole group. Co-teaching provides opportunities to do more small group and individual instruction. Co-teaching is not separating or grouping students with special needs in one part of the classroom even if these practices are well-intentioned. Co-teaching does not include teaching teams that plan together, but then group and instruct in different classrooms. Because all learners are in the core curriculum, or Tier 1, you will have diverse needs within the classroom. To meet those needs, teachers need to support all students by differentiating instruction. Differentiated instruction will vary the time, the content, and the degree of support and scaffolding provided based on students' assessed needs. In a differentiated classroom, you would see the use of multiple texts, a range of assessment tools and methods being utilized, adults collaborating to meet student needs, compacting of lessons, tasks and products designed with a multiple intelligence orientation, and extensive use of flexible grouping. There are three primary types of assessment tools. Screening assessments are used to determine if additional investigation is warranted. Progress monitoring are conducted a minimum of three times a year or on a routine basis using comparable and multiple test forms to estimate rates of student improvement and to identify children who are not demonstrating adequate progress. Diagnostic assessments are conducted at any time during the school year when more in-depth analysis of a student's strengths and weaknesses is needed to guide instruction. As we became more proficient with our assessment literacy, we became more refined with our instructional decision making. Progress monitoring in Tier 1 classroom is conducted by classroom teachers at Sand Hill. The co-facilitators send out a reminder that it is time to conduct the next screener as well as a copy of the needed materials. Co-facilitators are also available to help conduct the one-on-one -on -one screening tools if requested to do so. Once all students have been screened, classroom teachers enter the screening data into a shared drive spreadsheet. The co-facilitators then conduct quick sorts to see which students in the grade level have met benchmarks, those at risk of need not meeting benchmarks, and those not demonstrating adequate progress. The gifted and talented support teacher also sorts for students who may be in need of greater differentiation or further assessment for those not already identified.
Students who are identified as at risk on the screening assessments are monitored for at least five weeks. As we implemented our new literacy curriculum in Tier 1, we analyzed the results of assessments that were embedded in the program. We identified areas where we met our goal of 80% of students demonstrating high achievement on the targeted skill. We then met as a grade level team to strategize how to improve instruction in those areas that did not meet that goal. Our next step was to provide each teacher with a chart that would quickly identify which students have not demonstrated high levels of achievement. Teachers created flexible groups and retaught skills with identified students. The importance of maintaining fidelity to the curriculum cannot be emphasized enough. Consistent delivery is a must. Something as simple as editing symbols could be very confusing if each teacher has his or her own editing guidelines. Students will make better connections if there is a common delivery within the curriculum. In year three of our RTI implementation timeline, we began offering Tier 2 and Tier 3 reading interventions. When it is determined a student needs more instruction than Tier 1 alone, he receives a Tier 2 or higher intervention. He continues to attend his core class every day. However, he now receives minutes above and beyond the core instruction. Our intervention started out very linear. Our data told us we had to expand instructional options for our struggling readers. We were not making the gains we had hoped for with the limited choices in instructional services. By year four of our RTI implementation timeline, we realized that providing only one-size-fits-all interventions did not adequately meet all student needs. We began offering interventions for students who had significant phonics deficits, another intervention focused on vocabulary development, comprehension skill development, and a third intervention for students with fluency needs. All interventions pre-teach and reteach the Tier 1 core instruction. They also incorporate reteaching of prerequisite skills that a student did not master in previous years, such as regrouping during subtraction so students can be successful during the division unit. The more intense the tier, the greater alignment with teacher expertise. Interventions at elementary school would look different due to the fact that in the early primary years, you are focusing on foundational skills such as phonemic awareness. Interventions at this level will likely be shorter and of less duration. Research supports it is easier to close the achievement gap if early intervention is provided. All right, you guys found where we're going to talk today about uh, simple coordinate graphs. This is some stuff that you guys are going to be using in your math class in the next week. You guys will be doing some graphing about like your height and how long your arms are and stuff. So this is going to help you to understand this. I want you guys to start out with your math minutes this morning and see how you do on these. Some of these are reviews of stuff that you've been doing before. Some of this might be stuff you haven't done before. Um, yeah, see, if you can, see if you can get the milk deal out of me. All right. You can't do much better than this. While she's finishing up, can you work on your independent section here? This will help you to patch up some of the weaknesses that we found because this was that hardest multiplication stuff in the world is the stuff you still had to finish up yeah, on. Do you remember how to do those? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you do first? You go five times eight, Yeah, which take is eight, time, eight times eight everything times first. Down, carry the four. Right. Yeah. And then you go eight times four, which is 32 plus four, which is... Um, this teacher pre-taught the math target learning goal that will be introduced the following week. Notice he also worked with students on individual achievement gaps. While our math intervention model follows the same format as reading, it is less refined. We have been most successful when we group students at similar progress monitoring levels. For example, we have one class that has students working to pass third grade level math concept probes. Students in Tier 3 are taught by staff with greater expertise. They meet daily, 
and are in much smaller instructional groups than the Tier 2 classes. One dilemma you will face in implementing an RTI framework is scheduling. This is especially a challenge for students who need intensive support in both reading and math. Because Sand Hill staff determined that students would never be removed from Tier 1 classes for an intervention, we use the elective hours to schedule students. When students have no room in their schedule to add an intervention, parents are contacted for discussion of family priorities. Note the collaboration time that is built into Sand Hill's schedule on a daily basis. In an elementary setting, schools often create common extension time into their day. During extension time, all students are provided with an intervention, gifted and talented programming, or an enrichment activity. As you can see from our visual model, a common delivery is of the utmost importance because students will be merging into interventions from multiple classrooms. Therefore, the delivery of instruction on the targeted learning goals need to be aligned. Planning an intervention lesson begins with an awareness of the targeted learning goals that will be taught in the Tier 1 core the following week. Okay guys, um, today we're going to talk about the next story you'll be reading in reading class. And does anybody know what, um, well hopefully all of you know what theme you're on. What are all the stories that you're reading have to do with animals. Animals. Animal encounters. So you already read about grizzly bears and this week you're going to be reading about the golden lion tamarind. Have any of you heard of a tamarind? Haley, what do you know about tamarind? They are really small and um, they um, like they kind of like look like a monkey and they live like in like the kind of tropical rainforest and stuff like that. Okay, good. You know a lot about them. So tamarinds are a kind of monkey and they live in the tropical rainforest. So let's take a look at the... All of our reading intervention classes begin with front loading or pre-teaching of the targeted skills. Math intervention follows a similar format as reading. We have found that after providing this front-loading experience, many of our students have become confident enough to begin volunteering in their core curriculum. Teachers have been amazed at how a formerly passive student has become transformed into an engaged one. Teachers present a variety of explicit vocabulary building activities. The targeted skill of the week is first modeled by the teacher, then practiced by the student. After skills have been modeled and practiced, we always include an opportunity to apply the targeted skills in a text aligned with the student's reading levels. Intervention teachers developed a common curriculum that is always aligned with the core curriculum. For example, in planning a math front-loading lesson for Unit 6 data analysis, teachers would turn to their Unit 6 intervention binder to review the targeted secure goals. Next, teachers would select from an array of instructional activities including games and note any recommended technology connections for those skills. At monthly intervention staff meetings, progress monitoring data is reviewed to determine if any changes in programming need to occur. We also quickly discovered that students would squeal if they found out they had not had the same learning opportunities as other intervention students, such as learning a new math game. We believe using progress monitoring data to make educational decisions for students is key to the success of the RTI model. You cannot skip this step. You are constantly monitoring the performance of the student. The more intense the intervention, the more often you monitor the student. You do not want to lose precious time with the mismatch of instruction or intensity of instruction. Think of progress monitoring as a performance indicator of how the child is doing over time. When students are non-responders, staff have multiple options to choose from. Sometimes staff observe that a student seems to be grasping a concept but cannot yet demonstrate it with automaticity on a timed probe. 
In this case, they may decide to continue the same intervention for a longer period and later reassess if the student is gaining automaticity. Because class periods at Sand Hill cannot be extended, staff can choose to increase the frequency that a child receives intervention to daily support. Another choice is to place the student in a class with a smaller teacher-pupil ratio so the student receives additional opportunities for practice and feedback. To change the instruction, teachers can use input from the problem-solving team. Teachers can also decide to adjust the overall lesson pace by ensuring that students master a reading skill or strategy before moving on. Teachers can also refer non-responders to the building problem-solving team. 2005 was the first time our state began testing 5th and 6th grade students. As you review our longitudinal data, you can see that each year we have improved in reading. Our math scores have shown more variability, but show overall improvement. The data clearly supports that after students have attended five quarters with the RTI framework in place, sixth grade data is markedly improved from that of the incoming fifth graders. Probably one of the most striking changes that occurred after we implemented an RTI framework are the significant gains our students with disabilities made. Four years ago, when the decision was made to place all students into regular education classes for core subjects, we had a very skeptical staff. However, as our data improved, staff became convinced that combining core instruction with aligned supplemental instruction was a recipe for success. Chapter 4 is an instructional tutorial about progress monitoring using curriculum-based measurements. The following slides and video clips culminate with an application activity where you will be asked to complete a brief analysis of student progress monitoring data and compare your findings with our recommendations. The main focus of progress monitoring is student instructional decision making. Progress monitoring is conducted often and is designed to estimate rates of improvement. Progress monitoring data allows you to compare the efficacy of different forms of instruction and thereby design more effective instructional programs for struggling learners. When you think about standardized assessments, they are generally lengthy tests that are not administered on a regular basis. Often these assessments, such as our state test, are administered to students once a year. Teachers do not receive their students' results until weeks or even months later. The overall effect of this timeline is teachers cannot use these assessments to make instructional decisions or adapt their teaching methods to better support the needs of their students during the current school year. When thinking about classroom assessments, it is probably safe to say most teachers use mastery-based assessments to analyze their students' progress. The first step is the teacher selects all of the units that will be taught in a year and determines an instructional sequence. The next step is to design assessment procedures to match each step in that instructional sequence. Let's look at a visual model to help you understand the concept of mastery measurement. Here is an example of a typical fourth grade math computation curriculum scope and sequence. There are 10 target learning goals the teacher will deliver to students during the year. The first goal is multi-digit addition with regrouping. The teacher presents the instructional lessons and students practice multi-digit addition with regrouping. Using mastery measurement, the teacher may give assessments that look something like this. For ease of our discussion, we will use an assessment with 10 problems. Notice the test problems all deal with multi-digit addition with regrouping. The student goal is to master a minimum of 8 out of 10 problems. Students who demonstrate accuracy of 8 problems or higher 3 times move on to the next objective. If the teacher were to graph the student results, it could look similar to this graph. 
In the first week of teaching the target learning goal, the student did not get many answers correct. But as the weeks go by, the student gets better until he's had three consecutive weeks of getting 80% or higher of the multi-digit addition problems correct. Once this happened, the teacher moves on to the next target learning goal. The next target learning goal in the curriculum is multi-digit subtraction with regrouping. Again, as the teacher is teaching this target learning goal, she may give assessments that focus on multi-digit subtraction with regrouping. Take a look at what graphing mastery measurement data would look like if the student's progress is charted. One problem with this chart is that we cannot tell if the student is learning the target learning goals at a pace fast enough that will allow him to learn all the curriculum goals in the span of the school year. Teachers have to decide to move on to the next target learning goal, and unfortunately, some of the struggling students have not demonstrated proficiency on the previous target learning goal. An entire classroom of students may not have the end of the year target learning goals taught to them due to the fact the teacher ran out of time. Our school experienced this with the concept of probability. Summative data showed many of our students were lacking mastery of probability, and we came to realize it was a target learning goal presented at the end of the school year in several grade levels. Unfortunately, many of our students more than likely were never even exposed to this goal throughout their elementary school years due to this instructional delivery glitch. One promising type of progress monitoring assessment tool is curriculum-based measurement. It is an alternative to the mastery measurement assessments that are administered at one point in time. Curriculum-based measurement, or CBM, provides teachers with an easy and quick method of obtaining information on the progress of their students. With frequently obtained student data, teachers can analyze student scores to adjust their goals and better align the instruction to students' needs. CBM makes no assumptions about instructional sequence of topics. Instead, it assesses grade level target learning goals for the entire year. CBM fits with any instructional approach. CBM measures retention and generalization of concepts and skills. As a result, the teacher is constantly able to analyze whether the student is retaining what was taught earlier in the year. If you were looking at a CBM assessment, you would see some common attributes. The test items are selected from the year-long curriculum, and each probe has the same difficulty level. Due to the fact CBM probes can be administered weekly or even more frequently, the sensitivity of this assessment requires it to be quantifiable. CBM assessments and scores have been nationally normed. Throughout our presentation, we have emphasized the importance of graphing data. Graphs are a powerful tool that help us analyze and communicate data. When selecting a curriculum-based measurement tool to use in your building, it should align with national, state, and district standards. 30 years of research has validated this positive instructional outcomes when CBM is used by classroom teachers. The following slides will highlight how CBM differs from the mastery measurement assessments. Again, we start with the example of a typical fourth grade math computation curriculum. You will notice the 10 target learning goals the teacher plans to accomplish for the entire year are the same. In kindergarten, the probes measure number sense and have a different format. This slide illustrates a fourth grade computation probe. Grades one through six follow a similar format. Each of the computation tests consists of 25 problems representing the year-long grade level computation curriculum. Within each grade level, the types of problems represented on each test remains constant from test to test. However, 
The digits in the problems differ, and the problem's position on the test is randomly placed. The computation probes for grades 1 through 6 can be administered to a group of students at one time. Timing the CBM computation test correctly is critical to ensure consistency from test to test. Other forms of the assessment have the same types and difficulty of problems, but are placed in different spots on the page and use different numbers. When the teacher scores the student test, students receive one point for each digit answered correctly. The total number of correct digits is the student's score. Scoring each digit correct in the answer is a more sensitive index of student change. This type of scoring also allows you to analyze the student's responses in order to dig deeper as to why the student is not providing the correct answer. Let's look at another type of CBM math assessment tool. Again, within each grade level, the type of problems represented on each test remains constant from test to test. For example, for third grade, every concepts and application tests include two problems dealing with charts and graphs. CBM concepts and applications can be administered to a group of students at one time. The administrator monitors the students during the test and scores each test later. The score is the number of blanks answered correctly. Due to the fact CBM probes are based on national standards, we found it to be almost a perfect match to our curriculum. Teachers have also found the concepts and application probes extremely helpful in identifying gaps among a group of students within their classroom. For example, one teacher noticed that many students in her classroom were struggling with the concept of time. She took this valuable information and presented a mini lesson on this area of weakness. Students are encouraged to do as many problems as they can within the given time period. They are also told that some problems will be easy for them while others will be harder. Students are told to work on the problems they can do right away first, and when they come to a problem that's hard for them, they should skip it and come back to it later if time permits. Some of the problems have more than one blank. Students get credit for each blank they answer correctly. During the next part of this session, we would like to show you different types of CBN progress monitoring tools for reading. When thinking about assessment tools, the first decision for implementing CBM in reading is to decide what task is developmentally appropriate for each student. Students in kindergarten would begin with phonemic awareness probes and letter sound fluency. This is an example of a phonemic segmentation probe. This test is administered on an individual basis. In the early part of first grade, students are presented with a list of 50 words. This test is also administered on an individual basis. The student reads words for one minute and the teacher marks errors on the teacher's score sheet. The reading probes have been prepared by researchers or test developers to be of equivalent difficulty from passage to passage within each grade level. Reading probes are scored for reading accuracy and speed. Research shows reading fluency as a strong performance indicator of reading success. Oral passage reading fluency probes have been the topic of heated debate. We want to stress this is one performance indicator to be used with multiple pieces of data. For each CBM oral passage probe, the student reads from a student copy. For universal screeners, the passages are always at grade level. For progress monitoring at tier twos and higher, teachers will monitor at the child's instructional level. The examiner scores the student on an examiner copy. The examiner copy contains the same reading passage but has a cumulative count of the number of words for each line along the right side of the page. The numbers on the teacher copy allows for a quick calculation of the total number of words a student reads in one minute. Again, graphing is the connector piece. 
Scores that are going up indicate that students are becoming better readers. Flat scores indicates that students are not making adequate progress and require a change in their instructional program. So you all have a copy of this story, Mike's Big Fish. We're going to do a little practice first. So we're going to read the story, and you notice that all of a sudden you come to three words, and you have a choice. You have to make, pick the word that makes sense. So let's try it together. Mike sat on his bed and packed for summer camp. Let's see, Mike thought, I have B, my sat, pocket knife, and fishing pole. What makes sense? Brittany. My. Yeah. I have my pocket knife, so I'm just going to go ahead and circle my pocket knife, because that's the one that makes the most sense. What your job is going to be, once you get your story, you are going to use your pencil, and when I say go, you will have two and a half minutes to circle as many correct words as you can. Are there any questions? So what you're going to do is you're going to keep it turned over until I tell you to go. Get ready, get set, go. The maze fluency probes are used to monitor students' overall progress in reading. They are typically given in fourth grade and above. These probes can be administered to a group of students at one time. After the first sentence, every seventh word is replaced with a blank and three possible replacements. Only one replacement is semantically correct. In the video you just viewed, the teacher passed out different colors to her intervention students. Her students are being monitored at their instructional level, and each color represents a different grade level. Look at the following CBM May score sheet. The teacher counts the correct responses unless the student makes three consecutive mistakes. The teacher would stop scoring at that point. The student score for the May's fluency test would be a 10. We never make instructional decisions based on only one type of assessment. For example, it is not appropriate to put a child in a targeted intervention based on only a Dibbles assessment. Teachers need to understand the purpose for each of the assessment tools they are using. We suggest staff have a minimum of three different types of data or assessments to begin to make instructional decisions about a student. Graphing is such a powerful visual model. It allows students and parents to easily understand at what rate progress is being made. So here's your next one that we got back. So I want you to graph it like we always do. So you're going to put the date on there, and you're going to graph 10 boxes. So look at you improved. Nice job. What's the date? Today is May 21st. 5.21. Yep. And then you got to go up about 10 boxes. So look at last time, you were at 8, so you improved 2 this time, which is fantastic. So let's look through it. We need to work on. Ooh, you got radius and diameter right. We worked on that for a long time. Nice job. All right, how about we round to the nearest tenth? So we have 36.434, and we need to the nearest tenth. Which number is in my tenth spot? Um, 4. Yeah. So what's that 3 going to tell the 4 to do? Um, stay the same. Ah, so what should it be? 36, 36. point. Four. Nice job. We were extremely surprised at how our students responded to their progress monitoring graphs and individual conferences. Students have embraced their data and are very motivated to improve. They thrive on the feedback provided to them and have a true sense of what they can do to improve in their areas of weakness. 
At Sand Hill School, we celebrate when our students move to a new level or are dismissed from the intervention. As we implemented RTI, we carefully took into consideration the changes our teachers were experiencing. The following slides show the different phases of staff development with respect to graphing. Notice we started out with a very simplistic graph. Teachers entered data and monitored progress based on the end of the year benchmark. During phase two of our staff development, teachers learned how to add a goal line. The goal line is created by finding the median of the student's first three data points. The ending point is a nationally normed end of the year benchmark. Districts can also develop locally established performance goals. Goal lines allow you to get a good visual of how a student is doing. Jane is exceeding her performance expectation. You could consider increasing her performance goal. Our school is in phase three of graphing data. We want to set ambitious goals for our students. Instructional decisions are based on the ongoing evaluation of the student's graph. A trend line is graphed after the initial seven or eight data points. The student's graphs are re-evaluated using a trend line every seven or eight data points. You can readily see that we can set more ambitious goals for Jane. If her trend line were on the goal line, you would not make changes. And if it were below the goal line, you would reevaluate the instruction Jane is receiving. At Sand Hill School, all students who are receiving a tier two or higher intervention have a learning plan and a data portfolio that provides updated information about the student's progress. This learning plan is used to record their specific needs and intervention strategies that will be used. Their initial level for probes is recorded. When students meet that benchmark, it is noted on the learning plan. There is also a space for teacher comments and ways that parents can support the student's learning. All staff have access on a shared drive to the learning plans, so student progress can easily be monitored. Parents receive copies throughout the year. Due to the fact that a student could have different teachers for a math or reading intervention, we needed to figure out a way to have the student's data easily entered. This is a simple Excel spreadsheet where teachers enter the student's probe scores. Graphs are then generated. There are also commercially available data management tools. At this point, we would like you to stop the tutorial and download the Jane Doe activity. Based on Jane's learning plan and graphs, make some instructional recommendations. Continue on with the tutorial to find out our recommendations. Jane's current maze assessment shows she is positively responding to the reading intervention. Jane is being progress monitored at grade level and is very close to reaching the end of the year benchmark. Jane's oral reading passage fluency also shows great gains. She is being progress monitored at grade level and has reached the end of the year benchmark. Jane's intervention teacher will share her data with the classroom teachers. The intervention teacher will collect classroom data and will begin to consider Jane for a possible dismissal from the Tier 2 reading intervention. At Sand Hill School, no student is ever dismissed based on our intervention data alone. We always go back to the classroom and analyze what is occurring there. Jane would need to be reading materials at a grade level in the classroom successfully before she would be considered for dismissal. Math, on the other hand, continues to be a struggle for Jane. Notice she is being progress monitored at the fourth grade level. Jane's current data is below the goal line. She is not responding adequately to the instruction she is receiving in her intervention class. As a sixth grade student, Jane continues to have a significant delay. Jane's computation data is also showing she is not responding adequately to the math intervention. 
The intervention teacher is going to respond quickly to this concern. We would recommend Jane move to a Tier 3 intensive math intervention, which would meet daily and instruction would occur within a smaller group size. CBM provides a multi-level monitoring system that helps schools ensure greater levels of academic success. Here are a few examples of how CBM can be used in conjunction with a school's AYP. Schools can assess every student using CBM to identify the number of students who initially meet benchmarks. This number represents a school's initial proficiency status. Then the discrepancy between initial proficiency and universal proficiency can be calculated. Relying on CBM for predicting AYP provides several advantages. Because the tests are brief, schools can measure an entire student body relatively efficiently and frequently. Periodic testing allows a school to track its own progress over the school year. CBN can monitor a student's within-year progress. Graphs can be prepared individually for each student. They provide the teacher with information about a student's academic progress, whether it be in reading, math, written expression, or spelling. This graph provides each individual teacher with a month-by-month -month look at how many students in the class are meeting CBM benchmarks. Additionally, administrators and teachers can monitor the progress of their entire student body during the school year. The data line will indicate if the overall student body is on track to reach the desired benchmark by the end of the year. Administrators, along with building staff, can use CBM to monitor progress towards reaching adequate yearly progress as required by No Child Left Behind. Once the discrepancy between initial and universal proficiency is calculated, the discrepancy is divided by the number of years available before meeting the 2013-2014 goal. This number indicates the number of additional students who must meet CBM end-of-the-year benchmarks each year to meet AYP. In order to project if your school will make AYP by 2014, calculate using the following procedure.